Where did the internet come from and where is it going? And what about the internet of interplanetary space? Yes, that's a real thing. We're talking with an internet pioneer, Vint Cerf, and David Bray, executive director of People-Centered Internet, an organization that's shaping the future of how the internet can benefit society. Vint Cerf, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks, Michael. I really appreciate the opportunity. And just to briefly uh, say that uh, we actually have an interplanetary internet in operation now. And so as we get into the show, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, where that came from and where it's going. And of course, now we want to look at the more general question of what's happening to the internet on our planet. Our other esteemed guest today is uh, David Bray. How are you? And thanks for, for being here again. Thanks for having me, Michael. It's an honor to be on here with uh, you and Vint Cerf. Uh, and one, uh, really excited to get into the conversation about the uh, solar system-wide uh, internet efforts and why we can't just use TCP IP in space and, and launch it towards Mars, how we have to do some, some adjustments for that. And then two, talk a little bit more about the people-centered internet, which is dealing with the challenges here at home. Uh, and I'll put out an interesting thought conjecture, which is uh, as we are now... Uh, several decades into the experiment that is the internet, we may be discovering that the human component, um, how we receive information, how we process it, how we make sense of it, the challenge is, is uh, we aren't necessarily ready for that immediacy of both emotions and, and things that come with it. And, and then basically how we can do demonstration projects that can improve people's lives using the internet. That's what we hope to do with the People-Centered Internet Coalition. Tell us about Solar system level internet. Maybe that's a good place to begin. Certainly an interesting place to start. Well, uh, so I'm happy to do that. Uh, it turns out, um, in addition to some of the other hats I wear, including chairman of the People Centered Internet, uh, I'm a visiting scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and have been uh, in that role for, since 1998. So it's been over 20 years now. Uh, and in that early period, around 1998, uh, we had just successfully landed uh, the Pathfinder uh, robot on Mars after having many failures between 1976 and the Viking landers uh, and the 1997 uh, landing of the uh, Pathfinder. Uh, so my team at, uh, at JPL and I got together and we said, you know, all of these um, uh, missions to Mars and other parts of the solar system have been managed by point-to-point -point radio links from the deep space network, which is three 70 meter dishes in uh, Madrid, uh, in, uh, uh, in Australia, uh, and in Goldstone, California. Uh, so they're like 120 degrees apart. So as the, as the Earth turns, these things can see out everywhere into space. Um, but those point-to-point -point radio links don't have anything like the resilience of a network that we experience here on Earth uh, with the internet. So we asked, could we build an interplanetary internet? And we started out by thinking we could just use the TCP IP protocols that Bob Kahn and I developed way back in 1973 uh, and we quickly discovered that it wasn't going to work because the distances between the planets are so big that the speed of light is too slow. It takes between three and a half and 20 minutes for a radio wave going at the speed of light or, or a laser beam going at the speed of light to get to Mars and another three and a half to 20 minutes to come back. So we're talking about sort of 40 minute round trip times in the worst case. None of the flow control schemes of the TCP protocol would withstand a 40 minute round trip time. Then there's another problem that's called planetary motion. You know, the planets are rotating and we haven't figured out how to stop that. <laughs> so so the, consequence, <laughs> the consequence is that if you're talking to something on the surface of the planet, the planet rotates after a while, you can't talk to it until it comes back around again. So uh, we, we realized that we we're in a variable delay and very disrupted environment. We had to invent a suite of protocols that are more resilient uh, under those conditions and the TCP IP protocol. So we did that. It's called the bundle protocol. Uh, then uh, an interesting thing happened. We were just doing this as a speculative development. But in 2004, two rovers landed on Mars, Spirit and Opportunity, in January of that year. Successful landings, both of them. They were supposed to transmit their data back at a blazing 28.5 kilobits a second from the surface of Mars back to those big 70 meter dishes. And the radio's overheated. Don't ask me why we didn't figure that out before we launched these things. But everybody said, wow, we, let's be careful. Don't let them run too much because they might destroy either themselves or damage the uh, onboard uh, sensor equipment. So they backed off on the duty cycle. And of course, the scientists are all upset. Uh, but somebody noticed at JPL that there was an X-band radio uh, on the rover, 
which couldn't get all the way back to Earth, but it could get up to an orbiting satellite. By good fortune, we had sent orbiting satellites ahead to image the surface of Mars and figure out where the rovers should go. They were still in orbit, still had power, computing, and communications. We reprogrammed the rovers and the orbiters. This is the cool part. I mean, this is stuff, you know, like 35 to, 30 to 235 million miles away. You reprogram uh, these devices so that uh, we could use the prototype interplanetary protocols to squirt data from the rover up to an orbiter as it came along overhead. And the orbiter would hang on to the data according to the interplanetary protocols until it got to the point where it could see the deep space network and then it'd squirt the data down there. So it's store and forward, which is how packet switching works in general. All the data that's come back from the Mars missions, including the more recent uh, uh, Mars Discovery uh, uh, robot, uh, have come through that method. And then we uh, added the International Space Station to the system. So we have the Earth, we have the space station, and we have the Mars rovers and the orbiters all part of this interplanetary system. Uh, the protocols have been standardized by the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems, which is a UN construct. All of the spacefaring nations are participant in that. Mm -hmm. So now everybody has access to these protocols if they wish to use them. They're available on GitHub. Uh, and uh, and a number, a number of uh, terrestrial applications have arisen uh, because of the resilience of these protocols. So at this point, uh, we're ready to uh, deploy those protocols on subsequent space missions, including one which uh, NASA is now uh, in preparation for called Gateway. Gateway is a very interesting, rather eccentric orbit around the moon, which is intended to uh, uh, aggregate over time a number of modules, just like the International Space Station, and support a shuttle service between the uh, Gateway uh, orbiter and the surface of the moon. And that's in preparation for a possible other scenario, which might be a similar kind of thing on mm -hmm. Mars, where you could be shuttling back and forth between the surface of Mars. Uh, and an orbiter. So uh, I'm extremely excited about the possibilities uh, for um, a, a solar system wide uh, internet. And of course, now there's some consideration right. of how we get to the nearest star, which is uh, Alpha Centauri, is 4.3 light years away. And that poses yet other fairly difficult problems that are yet to be solved. Well, I want to remind everybody that we're speaking with Vint Cerf and David Bray. So, David, Vint was just talking about protocols that are open and shareable, continuing the tradition of the original protocols of, of, the, of the internet. And this leads directly into the subject of our, of our conversation. What is this openness, David? What does this have to do with, with why, why is this so important to the internet? Not from a technical standpoint, but from social, political, regulatory, every other aspect you can think of, a human standpoint. Right. Well, I think in, in order to truly have a global internet, which was the vision that Bob and other and uh, Bob and Vent and others had with the internet, was that 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 by making these protocols open, you truly could have interoperability and you could truly have a interconnected uh, planet that could share information. I think the interesting thing, and this gets to your question about where are we going, there have some that said, are we now, unfortunately, maybe becoming more. Um, there's some that have said, are we becoming multiple internets in which you're going to have possibly an internet that is with China behind the Great Firewall, they're controlling content, and while they're using TCP IP, they are doing uh, things that are heavily filtered. Uh, are you also going to have one that's possibly Russia's version as well? And then on a little bit more subtle note, you've got the United States and you've got Europe. Europe is doing GDPR, which is an interesting uh, general uh, privacy data re regulation, which is an effort to try and actually provide privacy for your data. But it's interesting because it also has some things that aren't defined yet. Uh, I've talked to some of the people that helped write GDPR, and I said, you need to protect healthcare data. That, that's good. That's glad you said that. But what specifically do you include and not include as being healthcare data? And they said, well, we'll figure that out under the next five to 10 years of court law. And quite frankly, in my opinion, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't think other than providing employment for the courts, 
deciding things through court law is the best way forward. And so I think you, you run the risk of a fragmented uh, approach going forward where there's maybe three, four different regimes trying to each carve out their own walled garden, uh, that is the internet. And I think to me, that's not what the original hope was of the 1990s, which was we'd have a way to all come online, we'd try to achieve greater understanding, achieve greater knowledge sharing. And, and part of what we've discovered is um, we have the human element to address first before we're truly ready for just the technical element of connecting the planet. So just a couple of thoughts to uh, add to uh, what David's already uh, summarized. The first one is that uh, the original impetus for the internet uh, was in fact a Defense Department command and control system uh, that would carry voice data and video. Uh, and uh, I would say that we succeeded you know, in some ways beyond our expectations with all of those mo uh, modalities. Uh, at the same time, we gave away the design uh, freely and openly because uh, we knew that allies would have to be part of the system in order to achieve interoperability uh, in joint uh, efforts. Uh, but we didn't know uh, who our allies were going to be 25 years hence, and so we decided the only solution there was to just give it away to everybody. Uh, that, so that was uh, uh, our original intent. Around the time, uh, the late uh, 80s and uh, early 1990s, Tim Berners-Lee was at CERN, and he was trying to figure out how to share physics reports uh, among his colleagues that included imagery and the formatted text and the like. And he came up uh, with the what it, we now call the World Wide Web, using the hypertext markup language to describe the documents and the hypertext transport protocol, which layers on top of TCP IP. Uh, and that was intended to be freely and widely uh, available because the scientific community benefits from sharing of, of its knowledge uh, as freely and as openly as possible. So David's um, description of what's happening from the governmental point of view is driven in part by seeing that the openness of the internet, the, the reduced barrier for injecting information into it and getting information back from it, has led to some side effects, which I frankly think that we hadn't thought through. Uh, one of which is that there are people out there who are deliberately injecting misinformation, disinformation, trying to you know, commit fraud, trying to in, invade other people's systems, create botnets, generate spam, uh, do denial of service attacks, distribute malware. There's a long list of uh, uh, things that malicious things that people do and they're of course scattered all over the world and the problem is that the victims and the perpetrators are often in different legal jurisdictions often crossing international boundaries leaving us with a fairly complex law enforcement problem and a fairly complex social and economic problem and as david has alluded to uh, this could lead to fragmentation it could be countries trying to wall off their part of the net to control it better uh, which would erode the utility of this openness and this exchange of content. So we are in a very uh, interesting and, and I would say complicated period in Internet's history, on this planet anyway, of trying to figure out how to maximize its utility while minimizing some of the harmful uh, aspects that are appearing. Where are we in the in developing the ability to manage these conflicts that you're just describing? So I'll jump on that hand grenade. Um, I, I think we're in the era of still trying to reach agreed upon vocabulary for some of the things we're seeing. Um, you know, in, in order to effectively address it, you first have to agree to terms. You can then use those terms to define what are the challenges and then work towards a solution. Right now, there's not even a defined vocabulary. Um, and, and so some of these things like you know, where people call fake news, well, maybe it's not necessarily fake news in so much as it either, is either misinformation or selective picking, cherry picking of the facts or the content to support your existing perspectives. And, and I equate this to a lot of ways. I mean, we've had, and as Vince said, we're at a very interesting point in human history. We've seen this before, too, with the Gutenberg printing press. The lecture we had there is we had about 200, 250 years to try and figure out what this really meant. And that was even then just for a portion of the planet. This is like giving everyone their own personal Gutenberg printing press at the same time and saying, go, go forth and do. And, and so we've got a much shorter time period to both figure out what does this mean? How do we harvest the good of it? How do we make sure we deal with the fact that there is going to be confusion about what really is occurring? That, that what you really come across to is our brains, I mean, our evolution select for our brains to have certain traits. One is confirmation bias. 
those in our species that had confirmation bias were more likely to pass their genes on than those who didn't. But the downside is now in an era in which we have such information bombarding us on a daily basis, confirmation bias also makes us less open to considering additional facts as they come in. Same thing with cognitive ease. The more you repeat something, the more someone's willing to believe it. That's what's done in advertisement. That's what's done in political rhetoric. But the challenge is, is the same thing is done on social media where things are repeated. That makes us more likely to believe them because it seems familiar, even if that's not necessarily what really happened. And then finally, it's just the fact that anything taken out of context can either be made to look good or bad. And so, you know, how do each of us make sense of this information abundance given that we also at the same time have flattened the gatekeepers. Uh, in the past, uh, there were only like three, where they were initially radio and then eventually television. While you may not have agreed with everything they put out, they were at least the gatekeepers and would actually serve as the conduits for what was going on. Now the challenge is, is everybody can print whatever they want, both good and bad. And so how do we make sense of what is going on in our world? That to me is an interesting challenge given that we do have confirmation bias, cognitive ease, and other parts that just make us mm -hmm. intrinsically human. So, uh, David, uh, one thing I would observe from that uh, very nice summary is that even book publishing or the printing press um, produced a similar problem because there was nobody guaranteeing that the content of a book was necessarily accurate or anything else. In, in some ways, the, there was some implicit um, implication that something was probably well researched because why would you go to the trouble of printing it? It's costly. It, so, you know, there, the presumption was that you would go to the trouble of assuring that the content was worth all the expense, except, frankly, we all know about books that are filled with misinformation and disinformation uh, very deliberately uh, to, intending to reach a particular outcome. So uh, we have that problem in the in the print world, and we have that problem now in the online world. The immediacy of the online world and the fact that everybody has his own printing press, as you say, uh, just makes the matter more difficult because there's more sources of disinformation and misinformation and motivation uh, for uh, injecting that content. Anyone who's been looking at the news media uh, in the recent two or three years will have seen uh, accusations of nation state interference with other elections by injecting controversy, by injecting misinformation and disinformation into our common uh, communications channel. So uh, I also thought that uh, it, would, it would be important for you to um, explore the utility and difficulty of critical thinking when it comes to you know, being confronted with a large amount of content and not knowing which facts to adopt and which facts to reject. So learning how to think critically about that and ask all the right questions is a non-trivial exercise and it takes a lot of work. It isn't clear that everybody is actually willing to put that amount of work into filtering the content that they are exposed to. Can I ask, jump in and ask a question here? Uh, what you're describing are problems of uh, human nature, uh, agenda, you know, agendas, and so forth that fundamentally have nothing to do with the internet. And so, why do we need to have that conversation uh, so prominently in the context of a discussion about the internet? No, it's because it's the it's the medium through which all of these transactions take place, and it's a convenient place to hang the debate. Uh, even though, and and there is a, a your question, of course, implies one other thing that there is an implication that somehow the technology, the internet, can solve the problem. And I think David and I would both agree that technology is uh, is challenged. Uh, uh, to deal with some of these problems because it isn't always clear what the facts are and there isn't some simple algorithm that says this is clearly a fact and this is not. It gets worse when the scientists assert X is a fact, they've done experiments, here's my theory, it validates the theory, and then 10 years later says, well, I made some more experiments and my theory was wrong and here's a new theory. And everybody else says, well, now we don't believe anything you say because you told us this other thing was right and then you said it's wrong and now you're saying this thing is right we don't believe anything which unfortunately erodes people's trust uh, in, uh, in science and scientific method, which is another- Exactly, it's the medium in which we communicate. Yeah. And I think the other thing to also think about, Michael, is the, to put it back, is, is there was a time period in human history in which we thought the, 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 the sun went around the earth. And then we discovered later that no, that was not the case, that the earth actually goes around the sun. I think we're discovering the same thing, which is, 
we're born into this world and we grow up thinking that our thoughts are our own. And in some respects, we may have the, the initial opinion until we grow up and become adults that the world goes around us. What we're discovering with the planet is now the internet allows us to see the planet as a whole and see different things in different contexts across the planet, which can be tremendously uplifting, that we can understand that we are 7.6 billion people on this planet trying to do our best to coexist, trying to best to move forward. But at the same time, we're also recognizing that things cannot be just left to individual thoughts of individuals or even just local communities. It's now thinking about the collective planet as a whole. And that's why we have to have the conversations about how do you relate to others through this medium called the internet that connects us all on the planet. So and eventually uh, all things go well on the solar system. So, so, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, now we have to worry about Martian porn or something. Um, <laughs> Uh, the one other thing that is very important about the internet and the things that layer on top of it, including mobiles and things of that sort, smartphones, is that there is an immediacy. Uh, there is there is no distance anymore. Things happen all over the world, and yet they become visible to you very, very quickly. The result of that is that you feel like every bad thing you've ever heard of is taking place in your backyard, uh, and this so this mis this distortion. Uh, of the of reality, uh, I think is, is hard for us to ingest because we uh, we are, our species evolved uh, with the notion of locality, and the internet erases the locality and causes us to imagine that everything that's happening around the world is happening you know nearby, uh, and our psychology uh, as a result uh, is uh, receives this as potentially alarming. Uh, so uh, this is a this is a phenomenon that uh, is is new uh any of the other you know telephone and telegraph and everything else had some of those properties but they didn't have it on the massive scale right like internet has now yeah the diffusion the, yeah exactly that telegraph could communicate but it wouldn't diffuse as rapidly as it does now on a daily basis let alone hourly basis and this gets to the questions then of what i would call virality which unfortunately the research is showing if you want something to go viral uh first make it angry second yeah. make it fearful and the trouble is you don't want to make it so that it makes everybody angry. You want to make it so it makes one group angry and the other group angry in response or fearful. Now, there's a little bit of hope that the third way to make something go viral is to have a sense of awe and, and an inspiration. So maybe we need more of that and less of the other two. But we're, again, we're, I think the, the fascinating thing is the Internet in some respects is a reflection of all of us as humans. And so if anything, maybe what we need going forward is a deeper understanding of the empathy and what makes us humans both at the individual level, but part of the people's internet is thinking about the community and the society levels as well. This is actually uh, em emphasizes the importance and role of anthropology, behavioral psychology, all these other things. Think of Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, uh, Sherry Turkle's book, Alone Together. There are a number of things to read that uh, it reveal uh, the human element uh, of this online communication system and what its side effects are. So given the fact that essentially what you're, you're saying is that the internet is a reflection of fundamental dimensions of human psychology manifest in this communication thing, this communication device that brings the world to us with this sense of immediacy and distorts that sense of locality, as, as Vint was saying. This being the case, why are we talking about, why are we even having this discussion at all? Because human nature is what it is, and uh, the protocols and communication devices are simply not going to change it. So why are we having the discussion at all? So I don't think we're proposing, and I know you're, you're playing devil's advocate, Michael, as you always do. I don't think we're proposing that the communication protocols should change it. I think, if anything, it's just discovering that we are now, in some respects, we have the feeling of feeling more connected now than ever. Um, but let me give you two quick things as well. So first is, uh, back at the, at the beginning of the 20th century, there was this actually school of thought that thought there were three types of spheres. There was the inanimate sphere, the geosphere of the planet. Those were the things that were inanimate. Then there was the biosphere, that was animal life. And then there was this idea of a new sphere, an OO sphere, which mm -hmm. would be eventually where we'd have collective thoughts occurring. And in some respects, that's what the internet is allowing to occur. But what we're discovering, though, is not all those thoughts are necessary thoughts for the good of individuals and human and human society. And like all things, I mean, it's, it's both mediocre and unfortunately has some bad things. But then what also happens is this other phenomenon, which is we humans have an inherent sense of fairness. Uh, we want things to be fair, which means even if someone offers, let's say someone has $100 and 
and they offer you a percentage, so they only give you a dollar. Well, well, economists would say you should take that dollar. We know that you're going to reject it if that other person gets to keep the other $99. But if instead they give you an offer that's closer to, say, 40% or 50%, and you feel like it's more fair, you're willing to accept it. And what the internet is allowing to do is it, we're now beginning to see what we think is perceived unfairness around the world. Some of it's real, some of it's not. The trouble is with social media, a lot of times people only put their best, their best side forward online. And so you, you, you have this illusion that everyone else's life is better than yours and that's not fair. And that causes anger and that causes interesting anomalies. But this also is not just unique to humans. I mean, again, going back to biology, Primates as well, they, they will eat cucumbers up until the point where they see that another primate is being given a banana by somebody else. They'll reject the, the cucumbers and they'll throw them at the researchers and refuse to eat, which is not logical, but it's again, they're seeing that being done with another monkey or chimpanzee and they want that banana too. So the internet is creating all these interesting second and third order effects, much like how books did for society when the printing press came out, that we're now having to deal with because the future of the internet at the end of the day is not the technology, it's how we as societies choose how to use it. Okay, Vint, if we are giving both good and bad actors an equal, equal access to this huge megaphone, is there any solution possible? And if so, what, what should we be doing about it? Well, I think we've learned uh, lessons from other technologies in the past. Uh, in some cases, the mass media, for example, have uh, regu regulated uh, limitations on what they can and can't do. Uh, there used to be the notion of uh, responsible journalism. Uh, you'd like to think there's still uh, small evidence of that here and there. Uh, but as uh, David has implied, uh, if you have a business model that requires lots of attention in order to generate revenue, then uh, you tend towards extremes in terms of what you uh, broadcast or what you put up uh, in the print media. Uh, we have encountered problems like this before. Let me use a, a rough analogy. I mean, the automobile gets invented. It, too, was a compressor of distance. It made it possible to live farther away from work and still you know, commute. Uh, it led to uh, the, the road system in the U.S., the interstate highway system, led to both a boom of automobile production but also housing uh, because of what it allowed, the affordances that it, it permitted. Uh, so here we are, we're, we're faced with some of the same kinds of things in the uh, internet space, but think about the cars on the roads for a moment. When the cars were first built and were you know, using cow tracks and other things because there weren't really any paved streets, um, eventually we realized that there were things that people could do with these that were potentially harmful, you know, like running into each other, running into other things, driving on both sides of the street. And rules got invented in order to tame the um, uh, chaos, uh, to try to put order uh, into chaos. And that's what we do. That's why we create rules. That's why we have regulations. That's why we have societies and governments. It's why we have social contracts where we give up some of our freedom in exchange for stability, you know, peaceful and safe existence. So we're going to adopt rules that will achieve those kinds of objectives in the online world. The big question, of course, is whether the rules differ from one country to another and whether or not the boundary between the countries ends up being in conflict or whether there's a way of making the rule set so more or less compatible. The United Nations Secretary General has empowered a panel, high level panel, to discuss digital cooperation, which is a nice broad term, it could mean lots of different things, but a portion of it is to ask the question, how should nation states uh, interact with each other, what rules should they adopt, how should they cooperate with each other in order to cope with harmful behavior on the net, even if it's crossing these international boundaries. I think we're going to need to explore those kinds of things. And of course, we also have local questions about how to deal with bad behavior, uh, how, to, how to regulate it, how to apprehend uh, criminals and, or harmful uh, actors. Uh, so we will be uh, working our way through this as the internet penetrates more deeply and as we become more heavily dependent on it. Uh, I don't want to go on and on here. I want to put a small place marker here for a discussion about internet of things because that introduces its own set of interesting challenges. So what about the internet of things? It's, it's, it's a very interesting point. <laughs> Well, uh, look, the simple uh, idea here is that we can program all kinds of things now, and they can have communication capabilities. So ordinary appliances that normally weren't part of the Internet can become part of it. 
uh, and that allows us to automate things. It allows us to uh, use externally obtained information in order for those appliances to uh, do useful things for us. Uh, there, there are these uh, uh, artificially intelligent assistants like Alexa and Google Home. Uh, and others, which uh, we interact with using voice communication, which is another manifestation of machine learning and AI. The thing that I worry about, though, is that everything is dependent on software. And uh, as David and I both know, and presumably your listeners know, uh, that the software is well known for having bugs and that it often leads to things that don't work the way they're supposed to. Um, uh, we don't need to go into the details, but you were experiencing something like that in the process of setting up this uh, conference call in the first place. So now what do we do about buggy software? And what responsibilities do programmers and companies have to protect people from uh, these kinds of failures? It just exacerbates uh, the, uh, the brittleness of the infrastructure that we are relying on. We have to figure out how to cope with that. So there's this very significant uh, technical component having to do with the infrastructure that has to be dealt with at the same time that we're dealing with the human dimensions and that is then expressed in uh, business models and what's acceptable to society in terms of even government regulation. And in fact, Michael, if I could add even a third dimension to it so we can make it a three-legged stool, uh, in addition to the people side and the technical side, what really is also a phenomenon that's happening that I think historians will look back at what was 2010, 2020, and, and what those decades were, we're instrumenting the planet in a way that's unprecedented for human species. With the Internet of Things plus small satellites increasingly getting affordable to launch cube satellites, we will have sensors scattered throughout the planet and have a availability for what's going on around the world that is that that the only time we ever came close to this was when we were living in nomadic groups and everyone in nomadic groups pretty much knew what was going on in that nomadic group. But now we're going to know it for the entire planet. And that then also raises questions about privacy, that raises questions about transparency, that raises questions about can anything you do be taken out of context? And then and you already see some societies where they are doing public shunning if you do something that the society themselves does not feel is something that should be done. And, and that's questions about how does that, how do we live in that world in which we have now instrumented the planet and where do we want to go and how do we want to live as, in, in this case, the United States, open societies, but there are other countries that will make other decisions that are appropriate for them, and can we still be connected as a planet through a global internet? We have a question from Twitter from Arsalan Khan exactly on this point, and he asks, uh, what happens when governments on purpose use technology and data to do harm? How do we, who's responsible to keep them in line, is his question. So this, of course, is part of the uh, challenge that the the high-level panel uh, on digital cooperation has been uh, wrestling with because we, we in order to uh, live in a uh, cooperative and constructive environment, we have to recognize that there will be these kinds of bad behaviors. And because of the fact that they are global in scope and cross international boundaries, the only way to cope with this is, uh, is to have a cooperative regime. There is one other possible way to deal with this, of course, and that's to have everybody cut off, cut themselves off from this global shared system, lose all of its benefits and value, lose all of the sharing of data and the ability to acquire and discover it, uh, and then try to lock everything up inside the you know, national boundary. Uh, but we have seen this huge appetite that people have. I mean, what is amazing to me is that even in economies where the disposable income is relatively low, there is a willingness to buy uh, these uh, smartphones, for example, because it gives access to information, it's because it allows this connectivity. So the answer is more international cooperation, finding incentives that cause individuals, corporations, and governments to want to uh, cooperate and collaborate to deal with the harmful effects, to, to cope with them and to suppress them somehow uh, by, while enhancing uh, the uh, positive benefits of this global connectivity. It won't be an easy uh, task at all, but I, I sense uh, a, a feeling uh, in many of the democratic countries anyway that this is, a, this is a value worth preserving. In the autocratic world, however, there's a great deal of desire to in, prevent people from finding things out, to prevent them from cooperating with each other because that might lead to a government overthrow. 
And so you get this amazing um, difference of view uh, about the utility of this kind of technology. It's interesting how the multiple points of view, as you say, we hold up in our society as an ideal, this notion of cooperation, fairness, openness, transparency. And yet, from a functional standpoint in many other societies, uh, from the for, for the leaders, it these are these are antithetical to achieving the goals. And I would go even further, Michael, and say, so there was actually a video done recently. It was a four star. Um, that was assigned to what was called the Pacific Rim, U.S. Pacific Rim Forces, RIMPAC, in which he actually puts forward the premise, which is some of those autocratic societies may be wanting to polarize conversations in more of the open, pluralistic, representative democracy societies, one, to demonstrate to their own people, it says, look, they can't even agree amongst themselves they're fighting amongst themselves or pulling themselves apart they're, they're, they're being driven apart so that helps reinforce their own autocratic regime to say well you don't want that because the the internet and, and what it provides and other things like that are polarizing your society but then too it also then hamstrings us to respond to the changing world and so this is going to be i mean 2050 whoever looks back from 2050 at where we are this is going to be an interesting next decade ahead that we're living in, in which you're going to try and see, Ken, as Ben said, I love that he said, can you provide incentives that work for all different types of regimes to try and suppress the less than great elements of what they could do with the internet and try to encourage more of the good positive elements of it, regardless of whether they choose to have a more autocratic versus open representative regime. That's going to be hard. And then even just put it in context, uh, with the People's Internet, we had a big event last year in December 10th, 2018, which was 70 years after the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Now, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights came after World War II, in which those countries that were participating came together and said, we want to make sure another World War II never happens again. And that was fresh in their minds, and they remembered all the atrocities and everything like that. Imagine, though, nowadays, if you try to get people to agree to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from fresh. Wow. I don't know if they would ever do it. And so so while we celebrate that we're becoming more progressed as societies and things like that, I think we've got some really hard, deep introspection to do as well as bridge building to do with others to try and again recognize that we're all in this pale blue dot together. We've got to figure out a way to agree to some version of human rights, both for the physical world we live in, yeah. but also the digital world we live in as well. So Im imagine that uh, you're in China right now uh, the Chinese government has made a huge investment in internet, and they've capitalized on it in dramatic ways. I mean, if you look at some of the companies that have come out of this, WeChat, for example, and Alibaba, and uh, WeWork, and it, in fact, oh, just here's an interesting observation. Driving down the street, downtown Washington, D.C., uh, this morning, I passed a little storefront that said, we work in English and Chinese. And it never dawned on me that the WeWork team would actually have what looks like, I guess, a presence in Washington, D.C. I mean, that was a surprise. So we have the Chinese making this huge investment and at the same time very concerned about the potential abuse, from their point of view, of this knowledge sharing, which the Internet supports. And so they work very hard to try to keep that knowledge sharing under control. Uh, so, so, and it, 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 we're going to be arm wrestling with with a lot of these phenomena for uh, some time to come. We only have a uh, five minutes or so left. If the internet technology is a kind of virtual Rorschach test that or proje projection that al or that allows people to project whatever they want and given the diversity of opinion as you've been describing in the diversity of goals can you in our last five minutes talk about some of the opportunities of the internet and how do we retain that Rorschach style transparency and yet at the same time impose some type of is moral discipline the right term? I'm not even sure what the right term is. So I think the first thought is, if, if the problem is, not necessarily the problem, that what we're coming into terms with is our own human natures. Can the internet help hold up a mirror to us and say, look, for example, did you know the last 10 news articles you read had this type of 
political bent or this type of media bent. And it, and it might be that you're okay with it, but at least begin to make you aware of it. Similarly with things with hiring decisions. Did you know that the last 10 hiring decisions, you, were, you, you, you tended to select people of this type or you made salary offers of this type? Because the reality is you're never going to have unbiased humans. But what you can do is maybe make us more aware. And so it could serve us as a reflection of that. The second thing is actually, I think we need more research into a science of humans plus machines. How do they behave? That's not, econ- that's not economics. That's not sociology. I don't, it's a new field. Maybe it's, uh, I've been calling it augmented intelligence. But basically, how do these humans plus machines behave in different structural incentives? If you push out different types of stimuli, how do they behave? So we can begin to at least have some explanatory and predictive science of that. And then the third, I think, is when you talked about sort of encouraging values, uh, while I don't want to assume that my values are the values that are right for everybody else, I'd say three things, which is encourage curiosity, always be learning, two, encourage empathy, so at least you can put your shoe, your, yourself in the shoes of somebody else. There's a wonderful phrase from President Lincoln that said, I do not like that man, I must get to know him better. Yeah. I feel like we've forgotten that and we're, we're, we're all just resorting back to our own shoes as opposed to trying to wear the shoes of someone else. And the third, I think, is actually a willingness to experiment, learn from, and try again. That, that we're going to have to figure out ways at the community level to, to have leaders that say, look, I may not have all the answers, but I can work with you to try and figure out what works best using this internet for your community, whether it's at the local level, national level, or global level. So it would be hard to uh, add much to what David has just said, but I will suggest to you that um, what we are all seeking, I think, in the, uh, our environment in which we live and work uh, is safety, security, some sense of privacy, stability, uh, and uh, in, in which and, and agency in which to operate, to have choice, to uh, to choose to explore things of interest to us, to share what we've learned. Uh, we're looking for those um, benefits out of the societies that we live in. Uh, and the Internet is a potential tool to achieve that objective. But as this conversation has demonstrated, it's also a potential avenue for all kinds of disruptive uh, kinds of behavior, uh, which would lead us not to the benefit that we're looking for, but uh, some real negatives. So figuring out how to cope with that at kind of all levels, the personal level, the family level, uh, the private sector level, the local and national government level, and the international level, uh, all of them uh, perceive, sense, and experience the both the benefits and the deficits of this online environment. And at all of those levels, we have to be seeking solutions, and that means we have to be talking uh, with each other about what we're seeing, what we're experiencing, and and what uh, we think uh, could be done uh, in order to make the situation more manageable and uh, and more beneficial, which is, of course, why the people-centered Internet was created. It was to focus on things like that. And we appreciate very much the opportunity to articulate that uh, on your program, Michael. We are pretty much out of time. Before we go, Vint, can I just ask you to take 60 seconds and describe your vision of the internet today? Has it changed since you co-invented the first uh, TCP IP protocols all those years ago? Well, the thing which is different, frankly, is the arrival of the general public in the network. It started out as a military experiment, then it became part of the academic community. Our National Science Foundation was a tremendous, played a tremendous role in the expansion in the academic world, reaching out to other academic networks around the world. But when the general population got on, thanks to the World Wide Web, uh, we saw a real sea change uh, in, in the uh, diversity of content showing up on the net and the applications to which it was put. And you just multiply that by the now 12 year old uh, smartphone, the iPhone that showed up in 2007. uh, And you see this rapidly proliferating uh, array of behaviors, content, uh, incentives, uh, and side effects. Uh, Most of which I have to be honest, were not necessarily squarely on our radar screen 40 years ago. Okay, well, we are out of time. I would like to express sincere thank you to 
uh, Vint Cerf and to David Bray. They are both involved with people-centered internet, so PCI, so check that out. Thanks for watching, everybody. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube and go to cxotalk.com. We have lots of great shows coming up and subscribe to our newsletter and keep abreast of all the great stuff that's coming out of CXO Talk. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>